Hello, everybody. My name is Renee Vander Avord. I'm the Assistant Curator of Canadian Art, and I am joined today by Erin Stadola, who is our curatorial intern in the Indigenous and Canadian Department. Um, we are joining you from Anishinaabe territory, which has been shared with Haudenosaunee and Wendat, and has been a gathering place for Indigenous people since time immemorial. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to share and care for resources around the Great Lakes. Values of care and mutual respect are at the core of the Indigenous and Canadian Department in which we are working today. So uh, I'd like to introduce you to our topic today, which is Mary Rinch and specifically the miniature portraits on ivory that she painted around the turn of the century. Um, we are very excited that Erin um, has joined us as a guest curator for this exhibition. It's opening on the second floor of the gallery um, as of September 26, 2020. Um, so we're um, super excited to, to share these precious works with you. They've never been shown before. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it over to Erin and um, maybe ask Erin, why don't you tell us a bit about who Mary Rinch was and I will get the slideshow going here. Great. Thanks so much for having me, Renee. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to telling everyone a little bit about Mary Rinch, and then hopefully they'll all have an opportunity to go see it. So this is a photo of Mary Rinch when she was roughly uh, in her teen years. Um, she was born in 1877 in England. Um, when she was eight years old with her family, she immigrated to Canada. And ever since a young age, she has always been interested in art. Um, she started studying art um, at a young age in Toronto. Um, she said, a quote from her is, I've always been a person with one idea. I had no other ambition than to become an artist. So starting in Toronto, she studied art. She moved on to uh, England afterwards to study miniature painting and she did the same thing in the United States as well. Um, when she came back to Toronto, um, she began teaching art and working on her own art career uh, professionally. If you wanna just move, the, thank you. There we go. Yeah, so she, uh, in Toronto, she was actually one of the first women to be a professional artist, to make money from her art. Um, you can see here, this is a photo of a group of prominent Toronto artists. Uh, there's only two women uh, in the photo and on the left there is Mary Rinch. Um, so it was very unusual um, at the time for a woman to be a professional artist and um, Rinch was able to do so. In her art practice, um, she was very interested in light and color, um, interested in how shadows and light work together. Um, something that she said was color was the only thing that she was interested in in her art practice. Here you can see her um, painting outdoors. That was another main uh, theme in her art was painting from life, painting outdoors. This is her in the, um, in Northern Ontario. Uh, she traveled there many years before a lot of people thought that that was an area of interest um, for art. And about 10 years later, um, the group of seven started going up to the Muskoka region. And so it's possible that she inspired them to go to areas like this. So she, you can see her here um, painting on this large canvas. It's quite amazing that she had a breadth in her art practice that went all the way from painting these large landscapes to, as you'll see, uh, the miniature portraits, which I mean are all under about 10 centimeters high. It's really incredible. She was, you know, a quiet and strong personality. Um, she wasn't afraid to do things that she was told that she wasn't able to. Um, and she lived this way until her death when she was 91. Incredible woman. This is one of her miniature portraits. Um, 
uh, as Renee said, that they've, they've never been shown at the AGO before. Um, so we're really excited to show them for the first time. Um, Mary Rinch had a few different phases in her art career. The first one being more or less um, the miniature portraits. Um, every medium that she took on, she was so accomplished in it. Um, she took on oil painting, as you see here, this is Sawmills Muskoka. Um, yeah, every, every kind of art medium that she took on, she was excellent in it. Um, she also did uh, later on in her life, a lot of printmaking. Um, so lino block printing, um, this is Northern Bloodroot. Um, you'll be able to see it in the exhibition as well. She was a very talented printmaker. Um, and as you can see, the colors in this um, are very striking. Uh, the composition is, um, is very detailed. And in order to be able to, to layer this and to get the details right, I mean, you can just tell what level of precision um, that she took in all her art. Um, I, I absolutely love this print and um, I'm glad Erin that you showed the three kind of major phases of her work. So the prints, the oil paintings and the miniatures because it does really underscore how versatile she was and how, um, again, as you said, just so talented in, in these three very different realms. Um, a quick note about this painting Sawmills Muskoka from, I believe it's 1906. Um, this was a really, this is a really important painting for Rinch because again, she's, you know, depicting these landscapes in Ontario before the group of seven, as you mentioned, and she's not depicting this kind of untouched, um, you know, this, yeah, this untouched view of nature. She's really depicting industry and the way humans are um, using the earth and extracting resources and there's this, you know, there are these kind of really large um, pools of logs that are, are floating here and you can see the smoke and the fire from the sawmill. Um, this was painted in Gravenhurst, which was then known as Sawmill City. So I, I love that she's really documenting this moment of, of great industry in a place that is now, you know, such a, a popular locale for cottagers. But um, I just think it's such a fascinating landscape. There we go. Erin, um, since the focus of the show really is the miniatures, um, I'd love it if you could tell us more about maybe her technique and her process and what these were used for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, at the beginning of Rinch's career, um, for her, this was a way for her to make money. Um, it said that she earned $30 um, for each portrait. They were usually commissioned um, by people in the Toronto arts community. Um, we don't actually know the identities of most of the sitters in the collection that we have, um, but it's still you know, a fascinating example of her work and as well of um, the fashion of the time and how women would have represented themselves and in Rinch's case how a woman represented other young women. So here's, um, here's another example. Um, you can see Rinch's amazing use of color and if you remember the fact that these are so small, the level of detail in these is just uh, simply amazing. Um, she depicted her sitters um, mostly in these serene poses. They look very, very strong, but elegant um, and serene. Um, they're mostly young women. So she, she does a really good job in capturing their youthfulness. Um, in their dress as well as their luminous skin and, and um, the kind of lightness that's around these uh, around these portraits. Um, most of them are not looking 
um, looking at the viewer, as you'll see in this one and the, the one previous, they're kind of um, oblivious. Oh, sorry, I guess it's the next one that she's not looking, but. Um, you know, they're, they're oblivious to our gaze. These portraits aren't for us. Um, they were for themselves um, or their families, um, which I think is another important thing to note. Um, how she would have made these. Um, miniature portraits have been around for centuries um, and they were having a revival um, around the time that um, people were commissioning photographs instead of paintings. Um, so this was another way of having a more maybe personal um, depiction of yourself or your loved one. Um, so they were really paper thin slices of ivory that she was painting on. Um, they were treated um, with a surface of pumice so that the watercolor was able to stick to them. Um, ivory um, isn't absorbent at all. And if you can imagine like a, a watery substance such as watercolor being applied to the surface, um, if it wasn't treated somehow, it would just slip right off and never dry properly on the surface. Um, as for the tools that she would have used, um, the paint brushes could be the width of a single hair. The detail is so fine and she needed an instrument fine enough um, that you could be able to pick up uh, on these details. Um, and as for technique, um, instead of doing large washes of color in order to be able to achieve the level of detail, she would have used um, more of like a, a stippling effect. Um, can maybe see this in the next portrait. So yeah, if we can even zoom in closer on the next one, um, on the left-hand side, you can see um, these kind of uh, out of, sorry, even further to the left. Yeah, there's these like out of focus um, areas where she would have just lightly applied the paint uh, to create this kind of like blotchy, dreamy, um, out of focus areas and then closer around the eyes and nose, places that she wanted to draw attention to. Um, this was, she would have etched onto the ivory actually to remove some of the paint and even remove probably the top layer um, of the ivory. Just to create a depth in this incredibly limited amount of space. Um, really, it's incredible to see these up close and in person. So I really, it's so worth it to go to the gallery and see these, um, to see these in person. Um, you'll be able to get so much more detail there. I'm so glad you included this detail um, because you're right, when you can zoom in on them, they're it's just so fascinating. Um, and I know in the exhibition, you've included an iPad. Um, that offers the chance for audiences to, to have like, a, it's like a video zooming in to, I think you chose four of the miniatures. Um, so you really can get that magnified look and then understand just how technical her process was and how, you know, this is no ordinary watercolor. This is really, really, really meticulous and, um, and labored. Yeah, exactly. Um, I really wanted visitors to have the chance to be able to be able to zoom in on it. Um, and yeah, like you said, just see the details up close to appreciate um, what level of precision and skill this must have taken for her to do these. It's really incredible. Erin, mm -hmm. did you want to go back to this note, this handwritten note that we found? Um, it was stored with the objects in the vaults. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, um, I love this. It, so it says, all these miniatures painted entirely from life photographs, uh, sorry, no photographs used. Um, this was a point that Rinch was very proud of. Um, a lot of times portraits would be um, painted from photographs, especially um, 
in her time, um, they were available. So you could have just you know, taken a portrait of your sitter, or sorry, taken a photograph of your sitter and painted from it later. Um, but she was very adamant that people know that these were painted entirely from life. Um, that's actually what the exhibition is called, uh, Mary Ranch Painted from Life, because I was just so inspired um, by her dedication to representing life from life. And she did the same thing in nature whenever she painted outdoors. It was really important for her to be in the situation and to see the person or the landscape um, up close in, in real life. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with her, um, her dedication to light and to color. And um, I know that she, as a, as a young woman, studied in Europe and New York and was inspired by the Impressionists. So, um, you know, that experience of being in a space and experiencing the light and then reproducing the effects of that light and the, you know, rather than kind of the static image of a photograph. I think she obviously takes pride in that. And um, to me, there's also uh, a reverence to the past to maybe to a time before photography. And she's using this historical, you know, um, method of painting miniatures on ivory which I know had a bit of a renaissance at the turn of the century, but I think there was this like longing for a time, um, a pre-photographic time. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was wondering, Erin, why, why do you think it's important to bring Mary Rinch into the space at this time? Why should we be, you know, um, spending time researching her and looking at her work um, what is it to you that makes her relevant right now? One of the things that really strikes me about her personality and her way of working um, is that she always, like she said, she always wanted to be an artist. Um, she was so dedicated to her craft and to creating uh, an arts community in Toronto um, where anyone could do the same thing. Um, she was a real trailblazer for women. Um, she was an example that women could be professional artists, um, especially in a time when there weren't many examples of women doing so. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great too honor her in this way. And um, I know in this space, we have um, an enlarged photograph of Mary that I think the third one you showed where she's working in the field. And uh, you can tell that she's just this great, independent and very strong spirit. So um, yeah, so thanks, Erin, for, for all your work on putting this together. Uh, did you want to say um, something quick about this last slide here? So this last slide um, is uh, one of her lino prints um, in the exhibition as well. There's a little, um, since she, Mary, Rinch, Mary Rinch was a teacher, um, she did save a lot of her teaching tools that fortunately the AGO has some of. Um, so you can look at her printmaking process, which is, I won't get into it now, um, but you can see it in the gallery. And it's also um, very meticulous and just shows her incredible skill. Absolutely, you can get a sense of it here, just how many, uh, how many passes she's done with all of the varying colors um, and the precision with, again, the, she's treating the subject of light, the dappled light in the trees through uh, lino block prints. It's really incredible. Um, so I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, thank you again so much, Erin, and uh, I hope everyone comes out to see Mary Rinch painted from life in the McLaughlin Gallery on the second floor. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.